space. You aim it for the entire world at large because you want everybody to share it, not just your audience. It's easy to get your audience to like and share your stuff because they're already on the same page with you. And it's harder to get your audience's friends to do it. Uh, and it's you know even harder to get your audience's friends to share it. And it's even harder to get your friends' friends to share and like it. And then if you can get Kevin Bacon to share it, you won. So you really need to focus on framing your content for as wide of audience as possible to get the widest distribution. Next slide. Um, so again, it's really, it's, this is really easy, I know. Uh, find a really piece of content, frame it, make sure your website, uh, uh, make sure your website is framed to really share uh, for stuff on Facebook. If you look at a YouTube link, a video on YouTube, it's not easy to find the share button. On our site, there's a big, giant share button, so it makes it really easy for people to share. Um, next slide. So again, this is just standard. Like you know, finding your content, you just need a hero and a villain, an emotional story arc, and a meaningful message. And you have to be in the right time at the right place. And you have to have a psychic on hand who knows exactly what the public is thinking about at any time. You know, it's really, really simple in, in that way. But as long as you have the basics of a really good story that connects with people emotionally, they're going to do it. Uh, Alan, how am I doing? Um, wrap it up. Okay. So. Uh, I'll skip the rest of this stuff, but basically the, the next slide just sort of shows you our top 10. And so basically all of these things have one amazing, you know, they all say things that resonate with their audience. They all say things that we're all thinking in the back of our head. You know, I wanted to be a part of this. I agree with this. I want to share this. And all of them are framed in an innocuous enough way that people aren't paranoid about sharing it with their friends. So you really want to make sure, again, that all of your content is framed in that perfect way and all I'll load the rest of the slides later, and you can look at them, and I'll explain the rest in another time. Um, we'll be able to dig deeper during question and answer, but uh, now we're going to talk with Beth Becker, who's going to talk about kind of bringing social and communication strategy together and some other stuff. So when Alan was talking a few minutes ago about COPE, create once, publish everywhere, Nowadays, you really can't do that. And the reason is really simple. Every platform we use in social media, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest, those of you who have read anything I've ever written know I'm obsessed with Pinterest uh, for good reason. And uh, Tumblr, anything else come up in the future have different demographics that use them, right? If you're trying to reach women with your content, you're gonna wanna go to Pinterest. If you're trying to reach college students, you're probably going to want to go to Twitter or Tumblr. If you're trying to reach young men between the ages of 18 and 24 who are really techy, you're going to go to Google+. Now, I didn't prepare a slideshow today because I knew I only had 10 minutes, but I will send Alan that he can upload. I do have a small slide deck that talks about the different platforms, what those demographics are, what kinds of content works on each demographic. But you need to stop and think about when you're creating your content, first of all, you don't have to publish every piece of content to every platform. That's number one. Number two, you don't actually have to be on every platform. If your audience isn't on Twitter, why are you putting your time into it? If your audience isn't on Pinterest, don't waste your time. Time is a really valuable resource, especially in the online world. It's really easy to let this stuff become a time suck. I'm a really, really big believer that before you do anything in social media, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, who is my audience? Where is my audience? What do they want from me? I recently wrote a blog post. Uh, you know, we always talk about social media as tools. Social media was tools, new tools that we were using to be social with. Then about two years ago, you started hearing a lot of people talking about social networking, that it was about the network. It's not just who's following you, it's who's following them on down the line. One of the main reasons why I hate people who worry about the number of followers and likes they have. Because how many people are following them is the important piece. Then last summer I started talking about uh, social sharing. And a lot of that was inspired by Upworthy. Move On has a thing called the Daily Share. A lot of organizations now are doing this curation of content, right? Crowd Tangle is a new thing that's getting ready to come out. It's amazing. Uh, it's in limited beta right now, but it's going to blow your mind. So it's about going through all of the content, finding the really good stuff that connects to people, that says a meaningful message, and sharing it through the networks. That's how you pass your message in social media and online. Lately, I've been thinking about it as social shopping. 
And I don't mean shopping in terms of purchases with dollars, although that happens too, okay? What I'm talking about is the fact that instead of thinking about the fact that we're here and we have content and we want you to come look at our content, I think it's time for us to start thinking about who is our audience and what content do they want from us? What are they looking for from us? Every organization, every campaign, every elected official, there is a reason your audience is seeking you out. Answer their questions. Give them what they want from you. If your organization talks about the environment, they're probably not coming to you for foreign policy information. That doesn't mean they're not interested in it. That doesn't mean you're not interested in it. That doesn't mean you don't ever put out content about it. Sometimes it's relevant. Sometimes you just want to be a well-rounded person or organization, right? We all have varied interests. But they're really coming to you for that environmental content. Give it to them. It works the other way, too. When you're looking to talk to people on social media, I, I preach social media's pyramid of strategy. Integration of the entire organization, quality content, authenticity, and targeted engagement. Know who you're talking to. You don't need to talk to everybody else. If I'm looking, if I'm an environmental organization and I have some great content about Keystone Pipeline, I'm not going to go talk on Twitter to somebody who's an economist blog because his audience isn't looking to him for information about Keystone. His audience is looking for information about the sequester or the budget deficit or whatever. So it's not just about knowing what your audience wants from you. You also have to know who in your audience to go and talk to. They're the ones that are then going to take your message and spread it for you. How much time do I have? 30 seconds, wrap it up. Yeah, two minutes. Okay, so I really want to, I, we can dive into this more with questions and stuff, and I'm always happy to, to talk in email and offline and, and have lunch and whatever, but I really want everyone to kind of think about the fact mm -hmm. that when you're creating content, it's not just about creating content for one particular audience. You are always going to have people in your audience that are kind of random, right? If you, if I'm doing content about social media, I happen to also have people that like to follow me because of shoes and cats, <laughs> right? So maybe you come to me with a piece of information about the economy that has a really good cat picture in it. I'm probably going to pass that along, right? I may not necessarily be an economic wonk, okay? I'm not an economic wonk. But if it's got a cat, you're darn right I'm going to go RT that tweet. Okay, so you want to think about the fact that content needs to be appropriate to the audience, but you also want to aim it to the right people. And I'm going to finish with one last thing, and this is my biggest pet peeve on the whole wide planet, linking of accounts. I know why people do it. I get it. I think partially it's laziness. I think partially it's that people have limited time. You're talking about linking. Linking Facebook to Twitter or Twitter to Facebook or Pinterest to Facebook or that kind of thing. And the reason I hate it and the reason I threaten to taser people over it, not that I actually own a taser, so just, you know, <laughs> hypothetically, uh, is really simple. You have 420 characters to describe your content on Facebook. You have 140 on Twitter. Although if you have a link, you now have 138. They took away two characters a couple weeks ago. Uh, if you're on Pinterest, you have 240 characters. Use those wisely. People who are on Twitter have different interests than are on Facebook. They may be the same people, they may not be. So if you're posting the exact same thing to all of your platforms and somebody actually follows you on all your platforms, you're boring them. And they're going to stop paying attention to you. And on social media, that's really easy to do. You can follow somebody and never talk to them or retweet them or mention them. On Facebook, not only can you like a page and not ever look at the page, you can actually hide them from your timeline so that you never see their content at all. So if you're boring people by cross-posting the same information to all of your platforms, you're alienating people. And that's the last thing any of us in the social world want to do. And now I'm going to turn it over to you. Wish I could. Yep. Just wait for this to uh, okay. load up. Just while, while he's loading up, um, we're going to post the slideshows and a wrap up of, of everything on Frog Loop, which is Care2's uh, uh, blog. 
And uh, so uh, hopefully I'll write that up in the next day or two. Okay. Uh, my name is Rashay Zamor. I'm Director of Strategy for Foresight Studios. We're a digital creative agency based here in DC. Primarily does uh, content strategy, design, and development for nonprofits. Um, so I think you've heard this point made pretty consistently across the board, but there's kind of this evolving ecosystem of content that we're seeing where um, COPE, which is very much, I think, associated with the old hub and spoke model where people would publish a, a bunch of content to their website and then publish it out via SMS, email, whichever. But I think we're now more in this kind of new model where we really have to think about content in four buckets. There's own content, which are the things that you're really producing for your own website, your any microsites that you're producing. Um, borrowed content, which is a curated piece, which is the type of content that we see companies like Upworthy doing. Paid content, which is uh, paid media, and we'll dive into that a little bit. And then that earned piece, which is really you know UGC and social media content. How are you getting people to actually talk about your brand? Um, UGC, user generated. User generated content. If you're not familiar with the. Uh, so one other thing to keep in mind um, when developing content for social media is that content is paid media, essentially. It's a lot of people, um, I think, think of advertising different from content strategy, but you're, you're, the content that you publish on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest, on other, or Tumblr, I should say, are really the, the, the pieces of content that you can ultimately turn into paid media ads. So you should approach content strategy from the mindset of a media planner. So figuring out like who your target audience is, and what are the platforms where those people really engage? So I think Beth made a lot of great points about really doing that audience research up front and really trying to figure out where, um, make sure that you're putting out the right content on the right platforms. Because at any given time, if you're seeing that, you know, people are engaging highly with a piece of content that you posted on Facebook, you can easily put paid media dollars behind that to amplify the reach of any particular piece of content that you have. So as you're developing um, a strategy for where you publish content on social media, also think about how can you amplify that content or the reach and engagement of that content by actually investing some paid media dollars behind it. So work with your advertising um, team if you do have one in-house or your paid media um, team to really figure out all this stuff out. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that there's almost this um, hierarchy to how you should be planning your social media content. So think of it in terms of, of media assets. right? Ultimately, you have a single message that you want to deliver probably across multiple platforms. So as a rough example, like pollution is bad, right? So you have multiple assets that you can use to dis distribute that information. Whether it be infographics, presentations, uh, videos, etc. Those assets should help you determine which are the best platforms to distribute content. So as an example, Facebook came out with a report last year that said by including images with any of your content, you can see upwards of a 34% uh, higher level of engagement. Um, we know that Pinterest is really a platform for distributing visual content and generally generates high levels of engagement. So really think about, based off of the, the assets that you have for distributing your message, whether that be a video, infographic, presentation, et cetera, determine what platforms that you really want to distribute that content across. This is kind of a, mo so really focus again on that message, determining what assets you have to distribute that message. And have that be uh, what helps you determine what platforms that you push that content out to. Um, and a couple of tools that you can, I think, think about when uh, looking at how, what are some of the technologies that you can be distributing content through. Um, Alfresco is, is just one of many con asset management systems. I don't know if folks, does anyone here use an asset management system or familiar with it? Anyone? Okay, so it's essentially software that allows you to manage large um, numbers of documents, images, videos, etc. And a lot of these systems are building in functionality for you to distribute content to social media channels. So if you're an organization that develops a lot of publications, or a lot of um, documents and images, you can use leverage um, tools like this to be able to publish that content across multiple social uh, platforms. Another trend that we're starting to see within content management systems is that, I think I'll, you're seeing this more on the open source side, but systems like WordPress and Drupal um, are starting to actually integrate system native, uh, tools natively, so if you are publishing content on your website, those out to Twitter and Facebook and other social platforms in a format that works, I think uh, systems like Hootsuite, if you publish out an image, uh, it doesn't actually host natively within Twitter or some other systems. What this will do is actually format it so all of your assets are formatted properly for the social platform. Um, and then really focus on community management. I think there are a number of tools that you should be really looking at versus kind of a, a social CMS, um, like a Buddy Media or a Hootsuite, that are really built for publishing tools to um, social platforms. 
Um, and then tools like Radian 6 and Attentively, and I think these are kind of a bucket of systems that we really don't think about when we're planning for social media, but they really help you get a sense of how people are talking about your brand or your cause. So you can use these tools to aggregate any tweets or Facebook posts or blog posts or blog comments people are making about any particular topic and to get a better understanding of you know, what are the issues that are important to people? What is the general sentiment around that? Are they talking negatively or positively about a topic? And where are these conversations happening the most? And these are tools that can really help you determine where you invest your time. Because if you're finding that people are mostly speaking on, um, say, having to post about a particular topic, and you're not finding a lot of conversation happening on Twitter, you really want to be where people are having the conversation. You don't want to have conversations in a silo where people aren't necessarily interested in your topic. So that was my brief presentation. Uh, I know there'll be a lot of questions, so great. Um, um, Alan, may I make a point? Yeah, sure. Questions? <clears throat> I want to make two points. Um, and one of the points that I, I'm not, I heard Beth mention it, mm -hmm. but that's really important in terms of strategy is what do you want your audience to do? And that is core to your strategy. So the first thing when you're planning a strategy is what is it that you're trying to accomplish who do you need to do what to accomplish it? You know, because as we're doing this presentation, it sounds like all we're asking people to do is like and share and retweet. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a, a property or a, to look at a new tool. You should be asking yourself, how is this helping me meet this particular this goal? So that just and then the yeah. second thing that I want to say, we haven't talked about tools. Rache, who is a genius, by the way, and the best PowerPoint person that I know, sorry, is um, really great at talking about tools and, and saying this is how, these are the metrics that we're looking at, and also Adam touched on it a bit, but we have such unbelievable metrics to churn on a moment. I come from the time when my clients used to spend $3 million on advertising to get, it's like, it's like a shotgun, and now with $5,000 I can drive a community of 60,000 people, you know? So we have tools that allow us to really target and really see what's working. No, we can't guarantee something's gonna go viral, but if we know what we're asking people to do, we can immediately look across platforms and see whether they're responding, so. Yeah, I think uh, metrics is really an important thing, <laughs> and we'll probably devote an entire session to metrics <coughs> in, in the next few months, but, uh, uh, and Beth and I are actually preparing some trainings for, uh, Rache and I also, the three of us, different venues, we're preparing some trainings on metrics. But the big thing I want to warn you about metrics, don't focus on the things that are easy to measure. Just because they're easy to measure doesn't mean that they're the right metrics. It's really easy to measure how many followers you have on Twitter, but it's usually not a very useful measure because a lot of people may follow you and never pay attention to you. Don't be a newt. Don't be a newt. That's, my, my, I wrote a piece, uh, uh, an article with some, uh, a couple colleagues uh, last year about how Newt Gingrich, who had 1.4 million Twitter followers, half of them hadn't tweeted in over a year, half of them didn't live in the United States, and about three quarters of 1% lived in New Hampshire and, I, in, and Iowa. Not very useful for a presidential campaign if you really think about it. And yet he had 1.4 million followers and everybody was very impressed. Uh, don't fall for that trap. There are uh, metrics involving uh, focusing on engagement, uh, the degree to which people are sharing your stuff, feedback, and click-throughs to your site, which are really, really key. Beth is often fond of, of indicating that the downstream on Twitter, you get up, uh, up to 10 uh, iterations of people retweeting you and to know who those people are and why they're retweeting and who they're retweeting. Um, I had, um, but again, I had, make your metrics measure what you want right. people to do, not just impressions. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes, sometimes I'm women, sorry women to just, keep going back to that. No, the, it's really important. Yeah, yeah. I think should, if you look at metrics in two buckets, right? There's optimization metrics and there's business metrics. There's business metrics are what I think you're talking about, which are really, you're trying to drive home some action, whether it's people to sign a petition, whether it's people to make a contribution, whatever. Ultimately, you have some hard number that actually proves whether you hit your goal. But then there's also this other bucket of optimization metrics, and I think we, we often kind of dismiss like likes and shares, because really we can get too hung up in that. But from a mechanic standpoint, they do matter in that platforms like Facebook determine, look at likes and shares to help figure out what brand content will actually show up in somebody's newsfeed. If your content isn't actually getting engagement, 
especially from you. So as an example, if Beth, who, <laughs> if um, Beth is not clicking on, liking, or sharing any content from, say, the Foresight Studios um, Facebook page, that content over time is not going to appear in her newsfeed. So ultimately, what you want to do is really focus on, although they are kind of not necessarily extremely important in terms of driving business metrics, they, you do want to also try and drive as much engagement as possible because otherwise your content is not going to be seen by your audience. And, and I'm, go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to address one thing about that, and that is, uh, and Alan and I have been talking about this a lot lately, and we'll be talking about it even more in the next couple months, um, is, is it's not just about how engaged is your audience with you, it's about how engaged are you with your audience. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when I when I work with clients, I literally give with them how engaged are they with their audience. Are they talking to people and having conversations? Are they liking other people's posts and comments? Are they sharing other people's content? Yes. In order for people to be generous with you, you need to be generous with them. And so it goes back to the same thing that I usually start every training I've done for the last three and a half years, and it's simple. It's called social media. If you're not going to be social, go build a better website. And, and think about this. <laughs> if, if you're running a fundraising campaign and your goal is to raise X amount of dollars from X number of people and you hit that goal and you think you're done, then you're wasting an opportunity because you've just created a social network, a community of people who've given you money once, and now you can figure out ways to get them to do other things for you, to engage them, to make them an ongoing community. The way I look at it is you run from, from a campaign to mobilize people to a community that, that you can rely on for a lot of different things as well as not just the things you ask them for but things they come up with on their own and that's how you ultimately build a movement right you can't get to a movement if it's always just a series of discrete asks and so one of the things that social has done to revolutionize online strategy is it's now a way to create a community and potentially a movement around your content around your mission around your organization or campaign in a way that you could never do with just a website. So uh, at this point, I have questions to ask them if you don't, but I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience and, and, and comments too. Don't, don't hesitate to add your two cents worth. Hi, so I'm on the, uh, the and, and please in introduce yourself. Yeah. So, um, um, are you posting? Are you embedding the video directly in it, or are you posting a link to it back on your site? Uh, I think we're doing a little bit of both. To be honest with you, we don't post a lot of videos anyway. Um, yeah. But when we do, like, we, we do it so rarely that I couldn't even tell you whether or not we're embedded or not. Sure. Sometimes I'm so, Facebook page and sometimes someone else is doing it. So. Yeah, yeah. The, so, photo posts get four times, at least four times the interaction rates. Um, and you can use them to embed links to content sometimes. Um, but they're really great for kicking up interaction rates, which then gets your stuff in more feeds. So like we, we rotate between sharing other people's content, doing photo posts, and doing links to our content, since that's sort of, sort of our bread and butter. But um, you, you need to make sure that the videos, you know, it's, it's not a question of whether they're sharing the video. It's, it's a question of, is the video good enough for them to share? So if they're not going to share something unless it really resonates with them. And an image is really easy to put an emotional punch in something simple, and it's one step. So people don't have to leave Facebook. They don't have to do anything. So it makes it really easy for them. If the video is amazing, it will share. But you also, the, the thing I didn't talk about before is sort of how we frame our content when we're getting people to go look at things at our site. We don't give them any information. We don't tell them what it's really about. We sort of give them a, 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 a tease as to what it really is. And then they're able to, and then they have to click. There's that sort of curiosity gap to go see uh, what it really is. So when you're framing your content, you have to be, to get people to come back to your site. And videos like that, if it's a really compelling video, they're going to share it. Um, but 
but you have to make sure that it's worthy of their time for them to make that investment. A lot of people are at work, but they also love to goof around when they're at work, and they love to waste time looking at videos. So, like, most of our big traffic comes from people who are at work during a work day. So, um, it's, it's not that they don't have the time for the video. It's going to be a question of, is that video, does it have a hero, does it have a villain, does it give them something, does it make them get that anger, happiness feeling that gets them compelled to interact? Two, two things to follow up on with that. One is, and this is a relatively new thing, so I don't have a whole lot of data on it yet, but the data I do have so far is very, very promising. Vines, six second looping videos on Twitter as teasers for full length videos is driving more views on longer videos right now. We did a test last week, we had a five minute video, we had a two minute version. When we teased the five minute with a vine, we got twice as many full views as we did with the two minute version and, with no vine. And vine is a six second video. It's a six second video that you literally, unfortunately not for Android yet. That's a fail, I'm an Android user, but whatever. If you have an iPhone, <laughs> it's an app in the iPhone store, it's free. You push the screen, it starts shooting. You push the screen, it stops shooting. At six seconds, you can then upload to Facebook, upload it to your Twitter and it's stored on Vine as well. That's number one. And how do they get to your, how do they get to your content, just out of curiosity? Well, you tweet it out or you post it on your Facebook page. With a link to the full video. With a link. Now, with a link. With a link. But what I've been doing, though, is I've been taking it, and then when I tweet it out, I take the video, and I'm able to then snag it and embed it into YouTube, into Facebook, as opposed to just sending the link. Embedding something always way better. If you're doing a link, I have found that by going to the link source, if I'm going to link to a website, I go to the website, I download a picture from the website, I upload the picture to Facebook, and then include the link, and I literally get double the number of impressions on that content. Yeah, just think about the way that looks. You know, when you put a URL into Facebook, it pulls a <laughs> thumbnail with text. It's a little tiny picture. But when you pull the picture off, and then upload the picture with, a, and then in the caption add a link, to the content, you got a big picture, and it's just that much more compelling. And then the only other thing I want to add is is one thing we didn't talk about when we talked about metrics that I really want to make sure we hit on. It's not just about engagement, it's also about action, right? How many people are actually doing something, and there's a new tool out there. Uh, I love this tool, I pay to use it. I talk to the developers every day, but I pay to use it. It's called Action Sprout. It's a Facebook application that allows people to take action right on Facebook. So they're not leaving Facebook, so therefore you're getting the virality, I hate the V word, but you get that word social graph firing of the open graph because they're staying on Facebook, so you're getting more impressions, therefore more actions, yada, 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 and down the line. It's pretty amazing. It's not super expensive. And the other thing is it does is because it's an authorized app, <coughs> it allows you to unlock your Facebook fans by getting their email addresses so that you can communicate with them on other channels. But the other, you know, they're changing the, the Facebook news feed now. They're slowly launching it for a lot of people, and it's becoming much more Pinterest visually, like, big picture oriented. So images are definitely going to be a much bigger factor going, for, going, within this, going forward. Could I? Within this context, just kind of uh, a way to wrap your head around it, Just Jess Thomas from uh, Jess 3 always refers to this as snackable content. You know, think about like stuff that. that you can snack on really quickly, an infographic, a, a picture, a short video, the vines. These are things that people can process really quickly. It's much more likely that they'll share it. If they are interested in what, you've see, what they've seen in that quick snack, they might click through. I always like to emphasize the fact that when you're pushing out to social media, you have to assume that the vast majority of people will not click through. And therefore, you have to think in terms of what's the message you're, ta you're attaching to that piece of content or that link. Are you sending out a message along with that picture that if that's all they read, you're go they're, they're going to get the message you want them to get? Uh, so if you don't do that, you miss the opportunity for those that don't click back. Uh, click back, I always look as a bonus when it comes to social media. So um, just, I think you're, you're also going to be getting a lot of great tips here. Um, practices from a lot of the testing I think we've all done right. but I also don't want to um, I, I want to overstress the need for you to like test your own content as well and because, your own audience right because I I mean you see best practices guides come out multiple times a year 
and I've followed those with clients and done testing and found content that overperforms what every report says are best practices. Like for a corporate client I worked with last year, we found by posting just a, a short question to our audience once a week, we actually got more comments and shares on that question than we got by posting visual, excuse me, visual content. So you might find with your audience that there's certain things that resonate or that drive engagement that aren't necessarily best practices that other people find. So make sure that like pull from these best practices that we're sharing with you and try them out and say how they work with your audience, but also do testing on your own based off of um, trends that you're finding within your uh, in your social properties. So one As metaphor that I have back to best, it's social media. We used to we used to use the metaphor at the very beginning in 2004, 2005 of the dinner party. I think of it now more like you're at a you're hosting a rave because there's so many different <laughs> things going on. And and but you got to be like, did you see? And you're walking around and do you know? And you know you think of think of yourself as the host of this giant party, you know. And um, that's just me. Yeah. It's that, really that, that always drives me to the. Don't think that social is about two-way communication. Right. Social is about three-dimensional communication. It's about your audience talking to each other exactly. and talking to people who are not in your audience. The two-way communication is important, right? But the goal is to get your audience talking for you. Kira? Uh, well, well and before she's, just one last thing I want to say. Uh, oh, God, now slipped my mind. <laughs> oh, testing, right. So one thing I always say is if you're going to do this professionally or even as a hobby full-time, uh, I always say that you need to be a part-time data nerd. And anything, and he, he I, I, can't, I can't emphasize what he said enough. Take best practices that you read about, taste best practices that we talk about. Test them on your own audience. Every audience is different. Like I said before, some audiences are on Twitter, some are on Facebook, some are on Pinterest. Think about who you're trying to reach. Do the testing. See what works for your audience. Facebook will tell you that the best time to post on Facebook is between 9 and 10 p.m. I have now I have now worked with a total of 40 uh, 60 plus electoral campaigns one major union and a whole bunch of nonprofits none of them was 9 to 10 p.m. the best time to post for their audience on Facebook Kara Adam could you hear her question yeah, okay. so I can't tell you, I, we have an A-B testing system that we just built, which I can't really talk about, but what I can't talk about is what we used to do, which is um, essentially we would put two posts, we would make two bit.ly links, so you get, you know, you create two versions of the headline, and you can, anybody can edit their headlines on Facebook when they're sharing it, so you can post something and then click the title before you share it and edit the title, I don't know if everybody knows that, but so basically you can edit the title and description. So we would have two bit.ly links of the nugget. The nugget is a post in our internal language. Um, and then you would post one for 15 minutes to, or, and then post the second one for the next 15 minutes and then hide <coughs> the first one, assuming that the second one was gonna be the winner. So you would pick the one you think would win second. Um, and then if the second one won, then you knew you did it right. The, another way, but they're starting to punish people for messing with it that way on the feed. So another way to do it is find um, two geographically similar, demographically similar groups of, of your audience and do, um, do di distribution just to them. You can just target specific groups. So like New York City and Brooklyn and say, you know, like we want this headline to go to these guys and this headline to go to these guys. And then you look at the total amount of clicks. The likes and shares are less important than the clicks because you want to know what's going to drive them back to you. So you just go to the bit.ly stats. If you just add a plus sign to any bit.ly link, you can see all of the data on it and, and how it gets clicked. Um, and so those are, those are two viable options. Facebook also allows you to pay for dark posts, which you basically pay like five bucks and you can distribute a post to your audience but not actually show it anywhere. And it won't be on your feed, but they can, you can then look at the bit.ly's from that as well. Another thing on that is I have found a lot of people don't have time to, to to try and game Facebook like that with that or don't have the funds to do that on a regular basis. Uh, I actually have people that basically do their A-B test on Twitter where they'll tweet out the link five minutes apart, two different versions, and see which one gets the most action on Twitter and then go post it on Facebook and we find that there's a correlation of about 90% on that where Twitter can accurately predict whether it's going to move on Facebook as well. So that's something that's quick and easy to do. 
But you again, can also use your testing. email list as well. Hey, if anybody got here late and didn't get a lunch, there's still more back there, so please go help yourself. Question. The one, the one thing I want to really reiterate, though, is you really do need to test because, like, uh, I was another slide I was going to show is basically my editor and I both wrote up the same exact video. Uh, it was about two monkeys in a lab experiment, and they kept passing a rock to the scientist. The scientist would pass them a cucumber back, and they'd go around in a circle. And then one of them, they handed a grape, and the other one kept getting the cucumber, and he got furious that the other monkey was getting a grape and flings the cucumber back at the scientist. And I thought I had written the most clever headline in the world, and it was like, uh, uh, you remember, remember Planet of the Apes, uh, it's closer than you think. And my editor wrote, two monkeys were paid in the unequally, see what happens next. My version got 10,000 views, and hers just broke a million on the exact same piece of content. So if you aren't... So our, our process is writing 25 headlines. If you, aren't frame, if you aren't spending at least half an hour just framing your content and nailing that part of it, you're wasting endless opportunities to get way more traffic to your website. As I said, videos we've po I've post got posted on Upworthy in the past have gotten tens if not hundreds of thousands of views where we couldn't get them any other way. Um, this has been a great session. Thank you. I'm Lynn Miller with Four Green Bees. I have a question for you, actually following up on what Adam said about views um, and what you just mentioned. There's been a lot of talk about views and driving the numbers, but um, it's not as sexy to talk about length of visitation, but to Suzanne's point, you can't take action if you're not reading, digesting, understanding what's going on. So I was particularly curious about that first example uh, with the two lesbians headline that was reworked. I believe Adam said it went from 60K views on The Nation, which is a really wonky publication that people tend to read you know, seriously. Um, to Upworthy, which I think is more people cruising the net, finding things exciting, moving from one platform to another, right? So yeah. with those 800K views on Upworthy, did you look at the difference in length of visitation between the nation and Upworthy for that same article? And can you talk to us about that? Um, we didn't because we were friends with the nation, but we don't, we're not like data comparing our, each other's stuff, but we don't actually post the articles. Well, we, we just post the video and then send people back to the original content provider to read the bigger and more in-depth thing. So um, it depends on how we frame it as to how far it can go back to them. Um, but, you know, it's it, it definitely grows that action. We often encourage people to take action on our site to go sign a petition or to go follow up with that organization. Um, and that allows them to get a lot higher interaction rates because they're people who they've gotten who are now actively invested in what they're doing. It would just be interesting. You mentioned doing a metric session next time. It would be really interesting. To yeah, it actually so won't be next time, but I it'll be soon. I feel like people always overlook it. It's not sexy. You know? So yeah. Alan and I were just whispering as you were asking that question because there is a company out there called Call to Action with a number two. Again, pay to use them. They're not somebody that I'm involved with that closely. Um, but they have a thing called Sparks where you can take a video embedded in a widget where people can actually take simultaneous action while they're watching the video. And you can then see at what point in your video are people moved uh, to take action. Like the hottest metric around, in my opinion. Uh, and they know that that's what I think. Um, but one point about that, and this is part of the reason why I'm so high on Pinterest, is that when I started doing this three years ago, there was a study, I know I need to still find the link for somebody, um, that the average person would watch a video online for one minute and, and uh, 22 seconds before they would click away. They re replicated that video test about halfway through last year. And uh, anyone want to guess how long people watch a video before they click away now on eight average? Seconds. How long? Eight, eight seconds. Uh, a little bit longer. 12 seconds. I know how to defeat that. Go, Adam. <laughs> yes, Tell Adam. me. <laughs> oh, guru. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I figured out that basically if you keep telling them all the exciting moments that they're going to be looking forward to in the next five minutes, I've made some. I've made 250,000 people watch an hour-long video about biblical uh, game uh, discussions. Like, you can make people stay as long as you want, as long as you tell them what they're going to expect when they get there. So, like, I tease them just like I do headlines. So, like, at one minute and 32 seconds, he says this crazy thing. At two minutes and 49 seconds. He says the thing we're all thinking. So like sort of teasing out the entire thing underneath the video makes people think, well, okay, I can just wait for the next part just to see if that. And they all have to pay off. If they don't pay off, people click away. 
But as long as those moments are all moments that really connect with people, you can get them to stay and share and interact. So um, it's, but she's right though that like, if you don't do that stuff, then basically they're, they are gonna leave if they're not immediately hooked. But as long as you set the stage for them to like wait around and, and see what's next, then they'll continue to keep looking. And, and you know, that's how we got that's how we got so many people to look at a racial profiling video was like there was like seven or eight breakdown moments listed that said you will not believe this and then this happened and this happened and this happened it makes them stay and then they get the whole picture so it's really useful in getting people to stay with your stuff it still has to be good content though because i remember it sitting really through, has to be good if it's not good sitting it's, through it's hamlet really by Kenneth Brand. By <laughs> over promising <laughs> then they're not going to stay no. I, I went to I, I don't know how many of you remember kenneth Branagh's hamlet I knew Billy Crystal and Robin Williams had a scene in the second, in the second after the intermission. Uh, I couldn't last. I left at the intermission. It was, it was dreadful. Um, so you still have to have something good to keep them there in the process. Now Jude Law's Hamlet on the other <laughs> and then there's, and for, then me there's, it's, for me, and it's there's, all about Kevin Klein's one-man And then there's Russell Crowe in the midst. <laughs> all right. Uh, we had uh, some hands up over here. Uh, hi, it's Scott Williams with the League of American Bicyclists. Um, you had talked at the beginning of the session about you've got to have a strategy and an end goal in mind. It's not just about page views and, and links and shares. But the content has been primarily about page views and links right. and shares. Do How do we bridge that? How do you turn that strategy into, let's just say, selling membership? OK. We should do that. You hired me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, what you do is everything you do, you do with that in mind. And when you're developing your content and you're testing your content, so so let's say you've got some research <coughs> and there are certain your research shows, and you can also use all these tools for research. I mean, I mean, Absolutely. unbelievably, like my budget for for um, research, which I just forgot the name of what you call that kind of research, but my budget for research has gone from hundreds of thousands of dollars for clients to like tens of thousands or even just thousands because you can test so easily what people respond to. But in any event, so you have some research. You say, okay, well, our members are this particular age. In the last five years, our acquisition of members have been these particular types of people. Well, let's go and see where those types of people are playing. Are they playing on Facebook? Are they playing on, where are they playing? What are they doing? Are they on Foursquare? Because whatever, you know, where are these people playing? Okay, let's now, um, try to test, I think Adam said they test 35 to 50 headlines. Let's test a bunch, because it's free. You're not paying Celinda Lake $80,000 to test the messages. So now let's test a bunch of headlines in these different places and see how they do. We're still in the research mode here. We're not even in the campaign mode yet. So you test a bunch of messages across platforms that indicate that's where you can get people engaged in membership. And you see which ones work the best. And then you keep spreading the campaign and interacting with the people in the rave that you're putting together. That's how, that's how I would describe it. But for me, because we juggle multiple clients, and you know, one of the nice things about being a consultant and not being staff is that people are spending you a lot of money to focus. We can't get this done, so we're hiring you to focus on this. So I can be really bullish with internal teams and organizations about focus, 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 focus. And I'm getting paid to get something accomplished. And when I first started, you know, my joke is if someone hires you to do social media and they say throw up a Facebook page and start a Twitter account, just fire them. You know, or if someone hires you to do a press to do media for them and they say let's do a press conference and put out a press release, then fire them because they're not thinking about how to do this. They've got to understand you, your audience, your goals. We get paid based on results. Not on not on growing audiences, but on results. Did the candidate win? Right? Well, I, not necessarily. I'm, 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 yes, I'm no. not going to go that far on that one. Yeah. But one thing I would say is that, and one thing that I have found to be true over the last three years, is we go and we spend literally six to eight weeks building the strategy before we even send a tweet right. or a Facebook post. And then we have, you know, part of your questions that you ask yourself when you're building strategy is, how long is this going to go, right? Is this a never-ending thing, like membership drive? Or is this, you know, are we looking for votes in the primary in six months' time, right? There's a time definition in there. And probably 
75% of the time, the strategy plan that we wrote on day one by day six has changed. And by one, day 180, it doesn't really resemble the original plan because we're constantly testing and doing iterations and, and changing. And you can't be afraid to experiment and fail. You're going to so fail this in this is medium. Just because we like to interrupt each other, and I particularly like to. We're good friends. It's okay. Yeah, it's fine. We've been talking about shoes quietly through our phones. <laughs> no, anyway, we haven't. Um, <laughs> anyway, we um, what I tell clients is that our strategy document is a living document, like the Constitution. Like you don't change it for nothing. Right. You don't add amendments for nothing, but you look at reality and you have your little supreme little scotus moment, where you're where you're changing. It's direction. easier to amend a strategy though. Yes, it's easier to amend a strategy, and you don't have to deal with Robert's thing, court. It, it is important to remember, you know, it's social, right? Mm -hmm. And so... But I want to back up for that. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt again. I want to back up from that, because we're here because we're social media people, but there's a, a lot of tools. There are a lot of tools. And, um, you know, so there's... We're talking about social media tools, so I'll be quiet. But there's a lot of tools to accomplish what you need, right? Right. But go ahead. I, I just want to, wanted to emphasize that not only does your strategy change, but your tactics are going to change because the nature of social media is it's a conversation. And if you aren't actually, you know, engaging conversantly in real time, if you, how many of you work somewhere where you have to vet every tweet before you post it? Let me at your oh, boss. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll come <laughs> tie up your boss and let you let you free. It's soon. really bad. Uh, the whole point is, if you can't engage in real time, you aren't going to engage effectively, uh, and you might as well not even try. Can I use that as a jumping so, off point yeah, to sure. pose a challenge to everybody? So there will, in the next couple of weeks, Colin Blaney and I are going to be posting a back and forth, uh, and it's really meant to be a thought provoking thing. So I'm just going to go ahead and start talking about it now. Sorry, Colin, don't kill me. Uh, I'm going to make a, a statement, and I, all of you are going to disagree with me, but let me finish what I'm saying Really, finish thinking it through. And I'm going to say that petitions as a tactic online are slowly dying. Yes, I know that sounds like heresy. My purpose in saying that is this. There are a lot of great petition sites out there. There are a lot of great petitions out there doing great things. But people aren't signing them as much because there are so many of them. People have petition fatigue. Petitions that once would have gotten a million signers are now getting a thousand signers. And it's not because they're bad petitions. It's not because they're bad causes. So my challenge to us as new media people, as online strategists, is to think about what is petition 2.0? What is the next step? For example, I have a client that's going to be doing Vine petitions, where instead of asking people to sign something, we're going to ask people to make a six-second Vine of them saying why this particular thing should be the way we, they want it, and then we're going to turn it into a couple mashup videos for web ads. What is petition 2.0? How can we constantly be challenging ourselves to move on to the next thing? Because tactics do get old. And when tactics get old, people stop paying attention. Another, another thing to say that we sort of have as an internal process is called joyful funerals. <laughs> uh, when a project, you really want it to work, and it's just failing horribly, someone can say it's time, and like, we have an intervention and people kill the project if it's just like too much effort for not enough growth. So like you need to be agile enough to remember and not get too like to hold on too tight to each project because every once in a while you're going to have something that really nails it and other times they're all going to die and you have to be willing to give it up and move on to the next thing instead of wasting time on something that will be an uphill effort. So be, be willing to give up your dream if something isn't working and, it's re and there's not, not a way to easily get it fixed. All right, one thing I, I, okay, okay. Just to add, I think one thing we haven't talked much about, um, which I think is extremely important, especially on social media, is this concept of social listening. I don't know, does any organization here actually analyze like what people, conversation happening around particular topics before they post content? One? Four. Okay, that's five. That's sad. <laughs> that's um, yeah. it, it, because it's such, it's, it's such an important piece. So before you actually begin planning your strategy, you should really figure out like what, what are you talking about or what are the conversations you need to listen to and use tools to actually see what like your potential constituents are actually saying about that topic. Like what are some of the keywords they're using? What is generally like what are some of the resources they're going to or sharing content from. Um, this is what Attentively and Radiant 6 and right, Water these kind of tools. Or, But th those, well, Attentively I think is more affordable, but. And you can use yeah, Hootsuite or TweetDeck totally right. as well. Right. 
do keyword searches, hashtag yeah. monitoring. And it can seem daunting because you're sometimes analyzing a conversation that could include 100,000 or 500,000 comments or, or yeah. posts. But if you get it to a manageable, manageable list, there are affordable systems that you can use, like Amazon Mechanical Turk is a system I live and die by. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. It's a marketplace for doing human data analysis, which basically means you can give a data set to this marketplace and say, I will pay you 10 cents for every piece of data you analyze. And you can run a series, a list of say a few thousand comments through the system and people will go through and say, this is positive, this is negative, this is about this topic, this is about that topic, and give you some actual data about it instead of you having an intern sit there for three days going through and analyzing each one of these posts. Like There's human also one called Peak analysis. Analytics that's just recently right. came out that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I would even push this a little further. Social listening is really important before you launch your strategy. And during. But then while you're doing it, exactly. listening to see whether or not your memes that you're trying to push out there are actually getting traction. And they yeah. can and be really used afterwards well. to help you measure return on investment. Did you create buzz? I want to just do a case study here very quickly. So I work on a lot of highly contentious issues. So I look in my, my tweet deck, I follow the hashtags that the, the bad guys are using as well as my own hashtags and I saw the Chick-fil-A thing turn on a dime yeah and I just by following free speech so if you take all of I'm not going to get into this Chick-fil-A thing but we were all like rah we won da, da, da. and then suddenly my Twitter starts pumping and I'm realizing it's all turning and no one's paying attention yeah so you know by looking at your various audiences and their, their hashtags also, we do a lot of work on um, democratization movements in the third world. And so, um, <coughs> because Twitter translates, um, you know, I follow all of the Arab world hashtags, right? And which has me now on 12 watch lists, I think. But, <laughs> um, but it's just, it's, and to me, rules. Twitter is free. And since, and since, um, since the, pe the people that I'm trying to reach are usually the influencers and the reporters and they're talking on Twitter, and I think of Twitter as where the conversation starts. You can smack me if I'm wrong, but you guys know more. Right. Um, Twitter's free. I can see where the conversation starts and what the news story is going to be in three yeah. or four days because it takes about four days to make it to mainstream media from Twitter. And one so. thing to jump off on that, one of the things that's awesome about Twitter is lists because you can have private and public lists. Yeah. And I don't know if you know this or not, but when you create a private list, People don't know they're on your list. I use private lists for op research to follow people who I don't necessarily want them to know I'm listening to what they're saying, but I'm telling you I'm watching them like a hawk. Mm -hmm. And I can see what's coming our way, okay? And you can see what the opposition is getting ready to do. Mm -hmm. We use that a lot. Alan and I have a tactic called DOE, denial of hashtag. We know which hashtags to do that too because we follow these people without them realizing it and we know in advance what they're about to do. And you should understand that it only takes about 10 people tweeting on a hashtag in concert with each other to change the direction of the content of that hashtag conversation. I've been able to uh, completely reverse conversations that were driven by Eric Cantor and John Boehner on Twitter and Kevin McCarthy, the you know House leadership on the Republican side, and I've been able to go in and mobilize uh, progressive tweeters to go in and just change the direction of the conversation within 10 minutes yeah. and sustain it for as long as I want to, as long as I keep at it and keep people uh, on it and keep tweeting, get people to retweet me. It just, it, it's very, very doable. So, and if you're gonna do this, and this is something I learned the first time I did, uh, the first time I put together a denial of hashtag campaign back in 2010, prior to the election, uh, the Republican Steering Committee was doing a campaign where they had a, a Twitter day where their members were tweeting online about their commitments to the American people. And I organized about 100 progressives to steal the hashtag away from them, to challenge them, question them and offer alternative hashtags, things like uh, uh, alternative commitments, things like whenever a member of the Republican caucus was saying, I vowed to make sure that government never gets between a, a patient and their doctor, 60 to 100 people would respond instantly by saying, does that include keeping government out from in between a woman and her doctor when it comes to the right to choose? I didn't even tell them to say that. They just did it when I said, hey, we should counter this. Um, but what happened was, in that context, uh, the Republican Steering Committee wrote a press release about the success of their Twitter day because of how many members participated. 
And Congress.org, which was owned by Roll Call at this point, uh, CQ Roll Call at this point, Politico, uh, a couple other news, uh, news media, ran either verbatim the press release or paraphrased the press release. I followed up with people I knew at those, organization, at those news media outlets and said, you missed the story. Here's the, here's the link to the search for the hashtag. And you'll see that the conversation was utterly dominated by progressives, even though there were members of the Republican caucus particip you know, participating in the, in the day. The lesson learned is, if you're going to do this, alert the press before, during, and after and send them the link so they can monitor what's happening, so they can see the conversation rather than the spin that comes from the organizing group. And, and a and more, for, more recent case study on that, right before the, the, uh, inaugur the uh, State of the Union speech this year, word got out that the Republicans were going to use <coughs> not serious yeah. as their hashtag. Oh, they dropped and that. so 24 <laughs> hours before that, Alan and I had a bunch of people tweeting things like, really, you're going to use not serious as your hashtag during the State of the Union? and completely took it over to the point where they abandoned it. <laughs> they didn't even try. So, so hashtags are also important to use in your content. I think we, we've talked about them in the context of like following conversations. <coughs> but if you're actually strategic about the hashtags you include in your own tweets and your content, you can see increases in engagement of upwards of like 30 to 40 percent. So there's great tools like um, hashtag.org. I don't know if anyone here has used it. What and, the hashtag? Yeah, what the hashtag. They actually allow you to see like what's the volume of conversation and engagement around particular hashtags. So if you're really strategic about the hashtags that you include in the content that you create, you can actually see a, a pretty significant increase in the number of shares and um, in retweets or likes or favorites. Yeah, one and if the, you're going to see the hashtag, make sure you predefine it using right. tag, dot, yeah. tag def and what the hashtag oh, and tag. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Also, um, you know, WordPress has a widget that allows you to preload the, uh, the, the tweet language that goes with when they tweet the article. So m the default is it pulls the title and the link, and if you're going to just have that, make sure you optimize your title based on what Adam was saying. Optimize the title so that when it goes out over, t over Twitter, it works. Uh, but if you have this, an, a widget like this, and there are probably alternatives to this, mm -hmm. uh, you can go in and actually create a tweet with a link, uh, which pulls the link automatically to the article, but isn't the title, and includes whatever hashtags you want. So you can use it to focus on the key talking points you want. And as the you know, days rolled out, you can actually change the tweet that goes with the article so that the tweets that go out tomorrow might be, you know, and then you know, also this, as opposed to just simply the same tweet going out from the same article all the time. If, if you guys have a software development budget, any of you at all, you should be spending your money on having alternate fields for all of, for your headline, a Facebook headline, a Facebook excerpt, a Facebook share image, because share images have to be at least 600 by 600 now and be optimized. So you should be adding that as fields, as extra fields in your normal content management and a Twitter and a Twitter field so that, so that all this stuff auto populates. We always do that and like, the, there's now um, Twitter cards, which are essentially when you put a link in, it shows you like the whole news story that you can yeah. attach your site to as well. So when we post a link to one of our, our our posts, it shows the headline, and we can also use the Twitter feed, the Twitter space to make an alternate version that teases the content more. Uh, Another so. way to think about it too is if you don't have that software development budget, because I think a lot of folks here probably don't think about publishing the content straight through your CMS. It might be when you're <coughs> writing your content, whether it be a blog post, a page, whichever, make multiple versions of that content. Like I, I tried to share within that, that hierarchy, figure out what your key message is and figure out what are the formats of content that you're gonna create. So create your tweet, create your infographic, create your, your blog post, three or four separate as entries. different pieces of content so you know that when, I, when we're ready to communicate this message to um, our constituents, these are the various formats that we're putting it in. But, one thing but to be don't careful. put multiple versions of the same piece of content on your website. Exactly. <laughs> but one thing also SEO to be careful about by Google. is when you're posting to Facebook, do it manually. Don't use a third-party app to post to Facebook because they say they don't do it, but I have data that really truly shows otherwise. If you use a third-party app, you're not going to get as many views. Yeah, sometimes it even strips out the share. And you might notice that Facebook has now made it so you can pre-schedule posts, because a lot of people were doing that using Hootsuite, but then they weren't actually benefiting because they were getting punished for using third-party app. You can pre-schedule posts in <coughs> Facebook oh, that's, itself that's natively true. now. Part of uh, that's because um, they're actually Facebook white lists certain IPs. So some of the bigger vendors like the Buddy Medias of the world, you're generally not going to run into that issue because they work with Facebook um, directly. So if you're going to pick a social media management software, 
look at the um, the actual developers list or people who are approved uh, Facebook API developers and pick a vendor from that list, not just a vendor because they're cheap. Like Hootsuite, you're not going to necessarily get great formatting from using that, but there are better tools out there. So I'm going to answer a quick question from our four green peas person. Oh, I was wondering uh, who that was. That, uh, about your Twitter list. Uh, oh. We've talked about making Twitter lists, and yes, there are limits to the number. You're only allowed to create 20 Twitter lists and up to 500 people on a Twitter list. Um, I just create extra Twitter accounts. Oh, that's a good idea. So, um, and they call that uh, now, stuff. well, I, I, I do two different kinds of things. I have different Twitter, I mean, I have multiple Twitter accounts that have different purposes. So IA Roundtable is for the Roundtable, Dr. Digipol is me personally, Take Action News is, is my news media company, uh, and then I have some, some sat satire ones like Good Pontiff and Rep Allen East <laughs> and things like that. Um, but uh, um, when I was at CAP, I had CAP Action and then I had CAP Action 2, and CAP Action 2 didn't do anything, mm -hmm. but it allowed me, you know, I never used it to, 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 as a sock puppet, I just used it to have a extra capacity for lists. And, uh, you know, that's a good way around it. It's, it's blunt force, but it works. If we keep begging, maybe it'll give us more lists. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, just wanted to follow up on your point about creating a separate <coughs> account for your advocacy work. Or it, have, what has been the success of that from what I've seen creating separate Facebook pages for an advocacy campaign or creating a separate Twitter account? Right, right. We never seem to get yes. as many So there's a couple back. things. Couple, I'll answer and then I'm sure Beth has a lot more to say. Um, from a personal perspective, Dr. Digipol, my personal account, I use it for everything. That's me. That's all aspects of my life from where I've had dinner recently that was really good to what's happening in Congress to what you should do on social media. It's a picture of who I am and what I do. That's my primary channel. Um, the IA Roundtable one I set up years ago when I first launched this. Um, uh, when Twitter first actually started, and it's a feed. It feeds Collins' ePolitics blog and Tech President, and then occasionally I go in and, and, uh, and add things to it. So it has a, a separate purpose. Um, the, 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 the satire accounts, they're fun. They're not really part of me. They are extensions of me, but I, I, do the, I use them for kind of different purposes uh, to be able to tell jokes on a certain theme. To apply the same kind of insights when you're putting together your Twitter and, and Facebook channels. So two things off of that. One is the key word in what Alan said a few minutes ago is purpose. If the purpose is to be a long-standing, long-term campaign that is separate from your main reason for being, okay? For example, um, <coughs> I'm working with a union that is doing a major organizing effort down in the south and they have a separate presence on social media for that campaign because while it is a part of their overall mission it is also very specific okay but at the same time they do cross post they cross this from the main union the union crosses from that the other thing is it's about authenticity one of the things we do on electoral campaigns and legislative offices we create the celebrity account versus the staff account the candidate, the member of Congress necessarily, doesn't necessarily have time to be on social media all the time, right? There are some members that do, but some don't. But the staff can always be on. It's run by multiple people, right? And it's clearly marked as staff. Uh, we also do that with nonprofits. You know, look, CNN has CN at CNN, right? It's basically an RSS feed of CNN. But they also have breaking but news. But all of the, they also have CNN breaking news. They also have sports. They have politics, etc. But the reporters also have their own accounts. Mm -hmm. And so the, they, they kind of mash it all together. New York Times, same thing. They have various sections of the newspaper that have their own presences. And their reporters all have their own presences that have the NYT in their screen names so that you know that's what they're associated with. So it really comes back to your first six to eight weeks of planning this campaign and thinking about strategically and what are your goals and what you want to do. Sometimes it's appropriate to have a separate presence, sometimes it's not. And it really, really is very, very campaign specific. There's no one answer fits all on that one. And also think about the voices that you're posting from. I, you see this, I think, done more so on the corporate side of social media than you do within the nonprofit sector. But for many organizations, you're really only going to have like one Facebook page or one Twitter account. But you can have multiple people that speak on behalf of the brand. I don't think anybody really believes that like, EDF is posting as EDF, like the organization is not like managing a Facebook page. There's multiple people within the organization that do that. 
So oftentimes, if you're comment, if you're responding to comments, you're responding to people's questions. You can actually post like your initials or identify who you are and start to as an individual give more of a human voice yeah. to um to who's behind the management of the Facebook page. One thing I've I've seen that was interesting that some organizations do is they'll list out on their about section. Uh, who the people are, like who the actual voices are behind the brand, mm -hmm. and they'll link back to that person's profile, just so you, you can actually see who within the who within the organization you're interacting with. Yeah, you and can we'll often see in Twitter. Defense, um, they've been genius, Kira, if you're still yes. here, <laughs> at getting their um, unbelievable experts mm -hmm. to use their own voices yeah. and drive news through their blogs and Twitter and et cetera, et cetera. Yep. say one thing that I often see done, and again. No one answer fits all organizations, mm -hmm. but we'll often, some of the people I work with, the organization has their account and they'll post things, and then the staff that's running that account will then go as their, themselves to answer people's questions and say, hey, I work at such and such, let me answer your question. <coughs> but the important thing also <coughs> is it's about authenticity, and you have to remember one thing as an organization, and this is something that I really should talk and write about more, quite frankly, and that is, Organizations are made up of human beings. You can't be afraid to show humanity in your organization. Okay, I work in an office for one of my part-time gigs that's very, very fun, right? We tell jokes, we throw red rubber stress balls at each other all day long. The boss brings in his dog sometimes. So on Twitter, on Facebook, we tell jokes, we post funny pictures of ourselves and cartoons and that kind of thing. I have another client who's extremely serious and would never crack a joke in public. And that's reflected in the way they handle their online presence. So be true to who you are. If your organization has multiple people running that account, it's okay to say that. You don't have to let people believe it's just one person. Let people show their individuality. It goes even beyond that. If you uh, look at the research that Edelman Worldwide does every year in their trust barometer, uh, people trust experts more than they trust institutions by 50% more. That's a significant difference which means that you're much better off having your policy expert tweet something and retweet it, or just like you're much better off having a byline on a piece of content on your website than you are just simply having it branded and come from your organization's brand. That's just, it just, it works better. <coughs> people trust people in general, and then when you throw social into the issue, remember, social is people talking to people. And so it's just a natural uh, process of identifying who you are. Uh, I, we would always, uh, we would always identify who was doing the tweeting with their Twitter handle in the bio of the brand Twitter account. Adam. Adam. That, that, yeah, it's it's really important. That's where we've gotten most of our success. It's not like as important to be have complete conversations in all of your comments, but it is important to be really conversational in the way you talk to people on Facebook because that's where they are. John Stewart is amazing at what he does and gets the ratings he does because he's very casual and talks to you like you're a person, and so like. The more you can frame your content in that casual, personable way, the more people are going to trust you. Uh, just a quick question. We've seen that Upworthy has a lot of success in terms of Facebook shareability. What are some examples mm -hmm. to look to for good sharing somebody who's successful on Twitter or Pinterest? Um, the, the guys at Think Progress are the masters of Twitter. Um, we suck at it and we're trying to get better at it, um, but they're really great at, at really handling Twitter and getting a lot of driving audience for Twitter. And I think um, on Pinterest, we just, I think like 5%, but Beth could probably speak to it better. Yeah, I agree with him on that. On Pinterest, I would go look at Unite Here, which is the union that represents hospitality restaurant workers. What Sarah is doing with their program Pinterest is uh, awe-inspiring to me. The other one is Working America. Uh, Doug was one of the first ones to pick up and run with the ball when I first started talking about Pinterest at Roots Camp a year and a half ago. Uh, oh, yes, it's actually only a year ago. Wow. Uh, but Working America is using Pinterest fantastic. Here's the important thing about Pinterest for you all to remember. Pinterest isn't about developing community. There are comments on Pinterest. There are repinning on Pinterest. That's not what Pinterest's purpose is. Pinterest is about driving web traffic back to your website. Right now, Pinterest is the only thing in the world that is driving more web traffic referral than Pinterest is Facebook and Google search. Wow. Yeah. Pinterest exceeds Twitter and LinkedIn together, combined. 36% yeah. of people who use Pinterest say they've actually purchased something they saw on Pinterest. 
Pinterest is about driving web traffic. You really traffic. have to test ways to drive them back to your site, though, right? Because like P Pinterest is really great at sharing things internally, but they don't really push traffic out as much. No, Pinterest is all about driving traffic out of Pinterest. Really? Yeah. Really. And, when, you when you click when you click on an over. image in you Pinterest, <laughs> when you click on an image in Pinterest, it goes to the source image. But wasn't so, Pinterest was it developed really as kind of a shopping model, like recipe sharing? Originally, so when Pinterest first yeah. came out. Uh, the people who took to it first were women, mostly. That's why back a year ago it was 92%. Now it's down to 72% women, by the way, skewing down quickly. Um, and they were posting pictures of food they cooked, and it would link back to a blog post with a recipe. They would post pictures of things they had made and link back to, to how to and, and to Etsy. Buy. And so uh, Pinterest has kind of developed in that sense, but now it's also about telling stories. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do with candidates and members of, of elected officials is we'll have a board that's devoted to their personal lives to show them as human beings. Um, it's also become a lot about you can, you can pin a YouTube video and people can then watch the video on YouTube and it counts in your YouTube views. Uh, it's uh, really used for telling stories and sharing stories. You might hear, honestly, I've got to call this one out because I think it's brilliant. They represent culinary workers in schools and hotels, et cetera, around the country, prisons. So they have a board that's devoted to recipes from their members. Tying into what Pinterest was about to begin with and telling their own organization's story. One of the things we've also done is we did an, we did an auction on Pinterest. We auctioned off restaurant stuff, gift certificates, personal chefs cooking for you, cook pots and pans, all that kind of stuff. 22 items raised six thousand dollars in four days. And also, if you have, if you set up for your organization an affiliate code at Amazon or someplace where you get a, a, a piece of the action if somebody buys something you recommend, and then post that URL to bring in the picture onto Pinterest, and people buy stuff, and you can set up a shopping. You know, if you've got, for example, who, who's here from the the bike uh, bike riders? You know. Uh, Bike, uh, bike equipment from sponsors, uh, you know, you can get a piece of that action by setting up a Pinterest page with, you know, reviews of and links to bike equipment. Uh, One of the other things that's really it. awesome about Pinterest, I have to give this a shout out, because, you know, I've already shared with you guys that I love shoes. Zappos has the best Pinterest application ever called Pinpointing, where you can go to this, you put in somebody's Pinterest username, it will go through and look at the things they've pinned and repinned, and it will make gift suggestions for that person. Yeah. And I tested it, I had to, because I'm a data person. I put in 10 people that I know really well, and it was 100% accurate about what kinds of gifts that pe those people would like. Yeah. Pinpointing. I would also say look outside of industry for inspiration. Um, this is something I, I do a lot. Just look at like what consumer packaged goods and retail brands are doing. Because they've, I think, recognized more so than like most organizations or companies, like the need for cultural relevance in the things they do, like the tweet, the uh, images that Oreo has been posting over the past uh, couple months, and the amount of buzz that they've gotten just from that is amazing. So I think also looking outside of the nonprofit and political sphere for inspiration is really important because there are like corporate brands who are doing really amazing things, and they have a lot of money that they're dumping into research. So you can sometimes glean some really good um, recommendations from from what they're doing. And I'm glad you mentioned Oreos that made me think of something. The other thing about social media is it's about rapid response. Alan asked a few minutes ago how many of you have what I call the noose around your neck where you have to get your tweets and Facebook posts approved first. Nothing drives me crazier as anybody who knows me well knows. Uh, but Oreo scored the success they did during the Super Bowl. Walmart scored success. Uh, not Walmart, Walgreens. Uh, Major League Baseball had an awesome tweet because it's about rapid response, making decisions quickly. But you'll also notice that they did it in one platform because it was about immediacy. Right, because they have to be able to respond in real time and know what they can. Uh, the classic story is new media strategies. <laughs> one of the biggest and earliest uh, uh, new social media uh, strategy firms, they had the Chrysler account. And one of the guys that were tweeting on behalf of Chrysler was in Detroit driving around trying to get a meet get to a meeting with his iPhone or phone whatever it was where he could tweet for himself and for Chrysler got stuck in traffic and tweeted out I don't know why they call this the Motor City these people can't effing drive 
Unfortunately, he tweeted it over the Chrysler account, <laughs> even though he deleted it very quickly. Uh, not only did he lose his job, but Chrysler canceled their account with New Media Strategies. VW was about to sign an account with New, Me New Media Strategies. They did not sign it. And New Media Strategies lost about half of its business and laid off about half of its workers. Here's, so. here's what I always tell people. And, and I do a lot of situations where I'll go into organizations to talk to the bosses, to explain to the bosses why they have to let the New Media people do what they do best. And I always say, put it this way. If you don't trust your social media person to speak for you, you have hired the wrong person, folks. You would not hire someone you don't trust to speak for you to be your press secretary. You better trust your social media people to speak for you. Otherwise, you have hired the wrong person. I just I want to make this one comment. Rache and I recently um, met with the International Trade Association, the giant trade association, and they were in this bind where there were there was a conflict at the top about who owned the messaging, it seemed from the, seemed in between the lines. And um, we were able to sit for, she was on the phone, right? So it was 45 yeah. minutes. She gave us 45 minutes, a good long, long term time client of ours, of Turner's. But we came up with this kind of module for her that I think would be, is a really great module where we would come in and do a day long training and then two half day trainings and in those trainings, essentially teach people how to write and also for the various media and also how to track their metrics and then track what they were doing over like six weeks. So um, just, you know, a, a, a completely um, shameless plug for a product that we developed on the spur of the moment. Um, and it was something that really brought the, the blood pressure down of the client because they knew that it would go through all their approval processes and come back. Mm -hmm. And they also had a global network, so they knew that they could create a situation where there would be approved tweets and that their staff would learn to improve their, not just tweets, but face all the different properties, their staff would learn to use metrics to improve their writing mm -hmm. and that you know we would bring in a, an approval process. So just it's just an FYI. I have a question for you about that playbook and that in this particular instance. Did they, so they put out like suggested tweets or whatever, that kind of thing, but didn't, didn't the individual running the accounts have the authority to adjust accordingly based on what that, they saw the what audience the was reacting to? The goal is to give the individual that because what okay. they came to us with, they came to me actually with a hundred approved tweets that were like you wanted to kill yourself. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. And I said to the, the person who was in charge of the VP marketing communications, we had a long conversation about strategy and blah, 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 blah. And when I dug down, it became clear that they needed, they needed to reassure their bosses that their people were properly trained. Yeah, this, and this is the key. It's simultaneously a, pro, a, a, a challenge of training your social media staff to do it well and training the leadership of your organization Trust. to be comfortable with it. So there's a managing up aspect to it that, that's essential. If, you're, if your top bosses don't want you to tweet, uh, you're not going to be effective doing it, and, uh, um, and you probably shouldn't bother. It helps to actually provide like executive dashboards for senior leadership. So if you're creating, like, it shouldn't be anything really complicated. Like, they don't care how many followers you probably gained in a week. But if they know that your goal for social media is to increase memberships or to get more petition signings, if you're able to just produce like a very, you know, right. two to three slide deck that says here's the progress that we made and present that on a weekly or monthly basis, mm -hmm. that can really help to build that trust in your leadership and get you more resources for the social media. And I would even go so far as to include in that sort of, you know, these are the message, th this is the, the, the message that we're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. This is this is some examples of some tweets and Facebook posts that we've used. We're working within these parameters rather than these are exactly what we're going to use and so that they and, and this is how some of them perform yeah. so that they can get a sense of you get what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say they can see the flexibility right. of how to say it without necessarily going off the reservation and, and they can see the performance of it. To, to, to Rache's point though when you're talking to very senior management they just want to know if the goals are being reached. Yeah. Right. And how are we reaching the goals? And here's one thing to think about too a lot of times the people in senior management haven't really experienced social media for themselves other than their own personal Facebook or Twitter. Case studies. I actually have gotten members of Congress to agree to do Twitter 
because I showed them case studies of corporations that came under fire and how their Twitter audiences protected them. And all of a sudden the light went off. Oh, right. If anybody wants those kinds of assets and links that they want to share with people, please just ping me. I'm really easy to find on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else because I do have like a whole set of links that I send to people to help you convince your bosses to let you do what you do. Sometimes just a, a well-written one and a half, one, one to two page memo of what the advantages they can gain by being on Twitter can work. Uh, I wrote one of these for James Cameron, the, uh, the, the director, and I wrote it on a Wednesday and on Friday they asked me to write a page rollout strategy for him because he was launching that app. Uh, so it is doable even for some who feels like they have no time at all, uh, you can make it happen. And sometimes it also helps to bring in unvested outside interest. Right. Right. Okay, I, I know Alan has done this. I'm sure that they would do it too. I know I've done it many times where somebody who's not working for your organization, who doesn't have a vested interest in your organization, comes in and talks to the senior people to make the case. And suddenly they're the expert that's trusted as opposed to the person <laughs> saying, give me a budget because I'm your social media person. Yeah. And it really does change the ball game. I have found third-party validation is I very want to good. Ask the group because I know we're running out of time. We're making a lot of assumptions about what your pain is, right? Because we've gone into so many different organizations and felt their pain. Um, are there what are what are kind of your burning issues before we start to, to wind down? I'm sorry, Alan. No, that's sure. your point. Controlled. Is there anybody sitting here that just has some burning issues? It's not really burning, but um, going back to your point of not assigning Right. Um, not the expert on all the policy work that we do. Trying to convince higher up staff members to participate in the social media process. We have a couple that are finally like creating their own Twitter and thinking about maybe sending their first tweet, maybe. And we have others that are just, I absolutely refuse to do it, I don't have time. Right. And convincing those people who actually are the voice of the organization, the, the main. Once relationship with somebody who is at a senior level in the team or in the policy team that you can quickly say, hey, you know, I'm about to respond to this on Twitter, does this, and, and send them language, does this make sense to you? I would, I would yell across the hall. Yeah, <coughs> so, that, so that's really, really key. Um, as far as convincing people to get onto, twi onto Twitter, uh, there are a variety of things. Number one, uh, the average in front of a camera. And people go, oh, I can handle a camera, uh, so that so, so it's not so hard. Uh, talk to them about um, time management situa uh, situations. I tell people that they op they should open up Outlook for email and TweetDeck or Hootsuite for for Twitter when they come into the office in the morning and leave them open in the back so that they can so it's just there as background noise rather than something that they have to make a point of doing. And that way they can, you know, if they're going to send out an email with a comment and a link to an article they just read to their colleagues, they can take an extra 30 seconds to tweet it as well. Get to that point. And if, they, and if you set them up with lists in columns of the people that they should be following, then they can see what their contemporaries, what their uh, peers are, t are tweeting about, and they can re retweet really quickly, respond really quickly, and see, well, this guy or this girl can do it. Why can't I? You know, and, and you know, so, so you put them in, the, in that situation. You help them make it as manageable as, pro as possible, and you help them be as successful as possible, and as they do it, they will become more and more able to. I've also found it really helps to actually do training. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I do three kinds of trainings. I go and I train the comm staff and the media staff, the social media people, about strategy and platforms and content development, all of that stuff, the stuff we're talking about today, right? I go in, I talk to the executive board, the presidents, the senior level. I say, this is why your organization needs to be doing it. Then I go to the donors, the stakeholders, the volunteers, the outsiders and say, you have your own Twitter account. You have your own Facebook account. Here's how you can help the organization you're volunteering for. Here's what a retweet is. This is how you retweet. So uh, we are out of time. And uh, it oh, went wow. uh, all yeah, the way fast. to a couple minutes after two. Sorry to keep you a couple minutes late. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Great thank questions. You. Thanks to the panel. Uh, thanks to We Act Radio for filming this, and we'll make sure it streams next time. Thanks to CARE2 and League of Conservation Voters for hosting us. Turner Strategies, Foresight, Progressive PST. Or actually, no. Oh, Indigo Strategies. Oh, Indigo Strategies. Uh, and uh, um, we'll hope if, if you came in on a... Uh, 
uh, multiple purchase and I don't have your email addresses and you'd like to be on the email list to get the uh, announcements yourself rather than whoever got it for you just give me your business card and we'll make sure that that happens and we'll see you next month Adam and Upworthy Adam. Hi Adam uh, just if anybody wants to send subs to us, our editorial side is totally separate from BizDev, so you can send me anything at links, the number four, adam at upworthy.com. Don't share that with everybody, but you can send me stuff and we'll take a look links at it. Links for adam at upworthy.com. If you have content that you think should go up on Upworthy, Adam will we'll, we'll take a look at that. Don't share that. Bye, dude. White Russians forever. Bye, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.